Uh, you are supporting the, uh, the Newman Center and the students. And I'm very, very, um, very honored to be, uh, to be able to contribute this. Uh, I'm trying to make it as interesting and as enlightening as possible. Um, April may have uh, advertised this as uh, opera uh, talk on opera and music, and indeed the focus will that will be the art focus of the talk. But I've this thought it would be very more enlightening if I presented it through through history, and why? Because history is the recording of human events, and art is the the most basic of human expressions. And so that art does give us the most honest, the clearest, the truest uh, representation of history, much more so than any, any uh, tome you'll ever read. And uh, I think for that reason, it's worthwhile. Uh, next slide, please. Slide next. Um, G.K. Chesterton called art the signature of man, and indeed the first recorded, uh, the first record of uh, human expression that we that we know of is through art, especially in the, in the caves uh, in France and in Spain and in other places. Uh, the representation here on the left is from the Lascaux cave in in uh, southwestern France. If any of you go, if any of you in that region. Please, please go there if you can, because it will be a, a, a momentous occasion. The art in there is spectacular. This is not the work of Neanderthals. This is the work of human beings. Next slide. Well, being human beings, it, it contains the basic elements of, of the base, the element in the nature of human being, and which is expressed throughout history. And that is solipsism. It's a nice word. It's used uh, philosophically and epistemologically, but I'm not stressing that here. I'm stressing it as self-centeredness or selfishness. We all are born completely self-centered and we have to get over that as we go on. And most of us do, no matter what our culture is, it's tempered in time by justice and concern for the rights of others. And, uh, but many times selfishness progresses to to limits uh, too frequently that are unacceptable. After all, let's look at the world around us and the bullying and the repression and the oppression and the betrayals and the wars and so forth. You know, self, they're all expressions of human selfishness, but fortunately for most of it gets tempered. And for us of us who are Christian, it gets, it gets basically, uh, uh, comes to the uh, second commandment of tra uh, treating our fellow fellow human as we would ourselves. And believe me, I think that is a, is a big task. Uh, the, that is our main task, and it's we all fail at it, but we all, we, we all need to keep trying. Uh, the, the Renaissance gives us uh, the turning point in, the, in, I think, in the history of art and music for for Western civilization. And I think Western civilization is still appropriate to study, despite what our universities say. Uh, and, the, uh, and this was ex mainly expressed through the Renaissance, uh, particularly in, 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 uh, in uh, Southern, uh, Southern Europe, but not but the, the Renaissance in Northern Italy was just as spectacular. But it was a strange amalgamation of the best of ancient Greek and Roman culture, which was totally anthropomorphic, totally self-centered, as Pythagoras said, man is the measure of all things. We're only interested in man. But it was a, so it's a very interesting mixture of that kind of philosophy with the Christian culture, which at that time was exceeding, exceedingly productive and uh, creative and uh, great, left us some of the greatest art we, we, I think, in existence. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. The, um, well, I mean, how? why did it take so long to get from ancient Greece and Rome to, uh, say, the Renaissance in, in 14 to 1600? Why did it take 1,500 years to do that? Well, I, there's a reason for that, and I think it's, in, it's important to know because it does have an influence on, on, on how we, we can study art uh, 
for instance, after Rome fell, there was a period of 400 years or so where people called the Dark Ages. But believe me, don't call it the Dark Ages because compared to our age, it was an enlightened age. It's true, it was a, a period of uh, invasion. Uh, the, the, the end of the Roman Empire and the invasion by Goths, and Visigoths and Orthogoths and Vandals and so forth and so on, which were very illiterate, uncultured, barbaric kind of people. Uh, but by the end of the end of the 800 years, they were Roman culture and civilization won out, fortunately. And most of them, and uh, their religion, uh, when it was Christian, was heretical. For instance, Arianism was the predominant religion at the time. But by 800, that was all gone, uh, and uh, Christianity was ready to to emerge. And then a remarkable thing happened in 800, and that was due to the man named Charlemagne, who was a warlike guy, a fighter, you know, uh, a trench guy all, in, all his life, to, again, like mostly the other, the other um, Goths. But he did something remarkable in, in, in the year 800 that changed, I think, the course of uh, Western civilization. He amalgamated in a way that uh, with the church, he amalgamated the, the, their society with the church in a way that propelled propelled uh, the Western civilization within 400 years to heights it never dreamed of. Because within that time, we went from small church community uh, schools to um, universities. We went from little boondock towns to great, great cities. And, and then we saw the emergence of sovereign nations, which then led to the, to this, to this, uh, marvelous cooperation. In the year 12 to 1400, uh, is a particular time because this is when we see the, the rise of, of, of art, especially music and art. And it's the first expressions of solipsism, of self-centeredness in art, which was bound to happen anyway. And it's not necessarily bad, but of course, it, as we will see, in some ways it was good, in some ways bad, but there it is. And then we come across the Renaissance, which is the beginning uh, of a, one of the most remarkable periods in the history of art, which ended in the Baroque and the, the Counter-Reformation. Next slide. Well, talking talking of sculpture first, because that was the first uh, for the first encounter with uh, ancient ancient art, and uh, and I must say it was a spectacular encounter. Here are two fantastic examples. On the left is the Dying Gaul, which is in the uh, Capitoline Museum in Rome. Uh, it's a place not often visited, but I, I, every time I'm in Rome, I go there to see it. It's magnificent. This is a, a Gaul that was back in, in Greek times. They were marauders and, and pirates. Uh, they had fantastic physiques. This, this fantastic specimen was dying of a small, chest wound, which we call a chucking, ch uh, sucking chest wound, and all the physiological changes that we see, and which I was, I was taught as, as, a, as, a, as a student in thoracic disease is displayed in this guy's face, so it's a fantastic thing. The other one is the, one of the most famous sculptors in history, the Lokoan, which was unearthed not far, not far from the Vatican, uh, discovered, and uh, the Pope sent Michelangelo himself to dig it out of the ground, and there it is. It's in the Vatican Museum today. Don't miss it if you go. There's so many things to see, but this is one thing you must see if you ever go to the Vatican Museum. Next slide. All right. So of course, uh, you know, uh, portraits are not just for the for the for the for the great or the wealthy or the powerful, all that's where they're mostly centered. And they, 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 they have to occur in ordinary life. And I like these two because this guy on the left was a guy who probably made it the hard way. It shows on its face. I think it's a good, it's a good portrait. The lady on her life looks like a lady who's trying to maintain social status. I like to know who her hairdresser was, but it, it's interesting. Next slide. 
art, art is an interesting, tells us things about people. Now, let me get just to mention again this legacy of Charlemagne because I think it was a fantastic, um, almost a miraculous thing. This guy is, you know, totally not on culture. He's a, he comes at this point in his life where he, he was able to unify all of the Franks. And so he had was the then head of a, a huge, a huge kind of an empire. So he he wanted to be crowned and he wanted to be crowned emperor. But the amazing thing is he did not do it himself. He asked the Pope do it, Pope Leo the Third. And he was he was uh, he was uh, crowned on uh, Christmas Day in the year 800. And as you can see in the picture on the left, he is kneeling before the Pope who stands above him and is, crown and is putting the crown on his head. And I just say, compare that to the, the picture on the other side, which is a massive picture. I'm sorry that you can't see all the see in detail, but you probably know it. It's the coronation of Napoleon uh, by David um, a thousand years later. And here, Napoleon is standing above the Pope, who he humiliated throughout the entire procedure. And he, um, standing above the Pope, pulls the, takes the crown from the Pope's hand and, and crowns himself. And so we begin the era, the era, era of separation, I think, of, of church and state in the worst kind of way. And I think it's a good technique if you want to be a power, power, power monger, don't, uh, don't destroy religion, uh, dominate it and control it. I think that's exactly what the Chinese are doing today. I think they're, you know, that's the right way to do it if you got that kind of government. Next slide. Well, what about uh, music between 1800 and 1200? Well, the, uh, the art was basically, you know, illustrations and Bibles done by monks spending, you know, hours and hours doing it. And then some of the works are fantastic. So man is <laughs> basically an artist. I, I listed the, one of the most famous here, the Book of Kells. And during that time, music took the form primarily of chant, which was, I guess, promoted by Gregory the Great. <coughs> he was not a musician, but he gets the credit for it. And uh, Gregory, uh, chant, you know, it, there are many voices but they're all singing the same note, the same time, and the same pitch. It gives uh, it gives that degree of uh, of reverence and devotion. I think uh, if you ever heard chant, you know it's a it's a it's a it's a soul encompassing kind of music. It puts makes makes all feel as one. The individual we are part of a of a whole when we when you hear chant. Next slide. Well, as I said, beginning in about 1200, things began to change because for the first time, men started to append their name to their artistic and musical work. And this was a big step because, I mean, uh, it was kind, kind of uh, never done, but it did start. It started maybe a little, a little earlier in music than in art, but in art, I mean, these, one of the first guys that we know of uh, in, in, in this period is Chimibue in the um, 1200s. So they were talking 800 years ago. Uh, his his uh, Maestà, Maestà was a, t a uh, popular theme, the, enthro the enthronement of, of, the, uh, of Mary, um, Her Majesty. Um, in uh, Byzantine art, which is the basic uh, influence uh, at this time here, uh, in Byzantine art, you know, they had there were icons, two-dimensional kind of icons, non-narrative, the kind of meditative, the, the promoted meditation and contemplation, um, frequently painted on gold, as this as this was, and but you can see there's more people. There's a there's a group there around there, so there's an expansion of. Uh, of that and also there is a a little bit of expression uh, in in uh, in the main figure, the Madonna and the Child. And right after him came Duccio. The the thing on the left is probably one of the most famous altarpieces in in art history. He is from Siena. It was in 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 the cathedral in Siena, uh, and uh, he uh, 
he carried the Byzantine um, uh, approach a little further. I see you could see it's much more majestic. It's uh, uh, the Madonna. There's, there's a great crowd around her, and and the the things above and below are, are addi additions to the art within in the Byzantine tradition. And there, these, of course, these two are uh, wholly recognized, but their fame has been eclipsed by a next slide by a, a man that came immediately after him named um, Giotto. You probably, uh, if you ever been to the uh, cathedral in uh, of, in, in Assisi, it's, uh, the uh, life of uh, some uh, part of the life of San Francisco on the second floor is done by Giotto. But his most famous work, his most famous work um, uh, compelled him to the for forefront in the medical history. This is a, a, a Maya style of his compared to the other two. You can see he carries, he's, he's getting out of the Byzantine um, uh, mode a lot more. The figures are uh, on the side are smaller. The, the Madonna and the child require a greater volume and they are more animated. So this, there's a change here, this, a significant change in the approach, and some of that, some of that, some of that came uh, from the north, from from Gothic culture. Next slide, uh, where there was a lot, a lot more emotion and and drama in front of them, and you could see that in their cathedrals. You know, their cathedrals; they were trying to reach the sky with their cathedrals, and one of the greatest is the cathedral in Strasbourg. And that's, I think, of frequently people don't know about it, but if you ever go there, your mind will be blown away. And on the right here, you can see this tympanum on the south portal door of the Strasbourg Cathedral is the death of Mary. And even though it's a small space, the small space contributes, I think, to the concern and the crowding of the, of the mourners there that, that, that it's a very dynamic uh, piece. And it's uh, the more you look at it, the more you see. It's a fantastic, and this is just a, a thing I think that most people who do go there would miss. It's an amazing kind of thing. And the piece on the left is really an amazing thing that was brought out to my attention. I would not have, um, I, it's small, it's just a wooden carving. It's, it's a church in Bonn, German. It's not a big tourist site, but if you ever go there, you should go to the church of St. Marian and look at the Röttgen Pieta. It's, as I said, probably done in 1300. Uh, you can see uh, it's just a little wooden carvings, kind of crude, but the emotional impact is fantastic. And I think it had an impact on a guy named uh, Michelangelo who did a Pieta uh, in marble. Next slide. Well, I have to just, uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time on Giotto, but he's so important. I have to say one more thing. The thing for which he is really famous is the Scrivegni Chapel. Scorene is a man's name, a family name. They were the, the biggest money lenders around <laughs> and they made a fortune. And of course, my, uh, it was called usury in those days. I guess it still is, although it's not a sin anymore. I mean, you, you're a, you're a, a, a economic tycoon, a, a hero if you do it, do it well today. But anyway, uh, it was considered a sin. You, you made money by lending money to people and, and, and making money off of their labor instead of your own labor. And uh, as a matter of fact, Dante put it in, in one of the lowest areas of, of, of the Inferno. And he mentions, he mentions one of the Scrovenies, by the way. But anyway, uh, they, they wanted to, uh, they wanted to, um, and I think the Scrivenius uh, accepted that and they wanted to do something in atonement. I mean, that's what we have to do. We have to do something to atone for our sins. And they got Giotto to paint this chapel, uh, which was next to their castle, which no longer exists. And when you go in there on the right, your mind will blow away. I've heard art, art <laughs> masters of every kind, every religion, every sort, go in there and say the same thing. You just have to go in there and see it. That's all I can say. I'd love to, uh, next slide. I'd like to, to show you the, the pictures and go them in detail. But these are, uh, you can see they're animated, they're dramatic. They, they tell the story, no doubt about it. And so as I say, this is a new 
a new feature in art, <laughs> and Giotto's the guy that propelled it right to the forefront. On the left is the is the betrayal of Judas, which actually made the cover of Time magazine once. And the right is the lamentation of the of the deposition of the body of Christ. And the way he depicts that, you see, everything just centers down on that. And there's a whole bunch of wailing angels flying above. It's a very, very, very effective thing. And I think art would have really it did take off at that time, but then something happened in the form of a, a pandemic not COVID, <laughs> something that makes COVID look like a, like a, a cold, um, but the uh, Black Death, which decimated, as you know, Europe, and um, it stopped uh, art. And when art did start up again, there was a period, a very, very sober period, when people did not have this kind of emotional impact. They, all the art then was very non-narrative, again, very Byzantine, a solitary, non-moving kind of uh, art that, uh, that uh, inspired uh, meditation and contemplation. Uh, but, uh, so, but, next slide. But uh, that, uh, but Giotto's art was not going to go, go away. And as soon as people, as soon as society recovered from the plague, they say Giotto was reborn. He was reborn in a guy called Macho. And Macho is a fantastic guy because of his insights into linear perspective, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but he was a master painter. This is his Maestà, which comes from the Pisa altarpiece, a fantastic, fantastic work, which has been chopped up and sold all over the world because people, I guess, needed money. I've seen a digital reconstruction of the piece altarpiece, and it's magnificent. And this is the Maestà, which again, you can see the, the Duccio Maestà carry a little bit further, the greater volume and expression in the Madonna and the child. And it's a fantastic piece, but that's not, that's not his most famous work. His most famous work is in a chapel in Florence called the Brancacci Chapel. Ancacci was a wealthy silk merchant who in the church of Santa Maria del Carmine, which is not far from the Pitti Palace, uh, had a little chapel made and there are about, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 paintings in there. Uh, two thirds of them done by Maccio. They were, the chapel was started by a guy named Masolino, who was a, uh, an international Gothic kind, you know, pro plague type of painter. And uh, to give you an idea, next slide. As you, as, you ex, as you exit the Brancacci Chapel, on one side is an expulsion from the garden by Masolino, and on the other side, there's an expulsion from the garden by Masaccio. And here you can see, yeah, tremendous difference. This is the, the Masolino, you see, was a nice, nice, polite guy. Adam and Eve are very sedate and kind of uh, elegant and refined. And Eve seems to be saying to Adam, dear, I think we're going to have to move. And there's a nice snake twirling around. The snake has a nice hairdo, you know, it's very, it's a very nice, uh, very nice. And then you look at Masaccio and there's Eve. She's, her face is, uh, it looks like the scream uh, from Edward Munch's painting, you know, and uh, total dejection and by uh, Adam and an angel uh, above them saying, you're out of here, you know what I mean? A different, a different kind of approach to the thing. So emotion, feeling, and drama was definitely coming into the picture, no doubt about it. Okay, next slide. Well, then the major next slide, please. Next, the, the major event that occurred and stimulated painting was the development of what we call linear perspective. You know, you look down a railroad track, and they seem to, they seem to merge in the distance so that the further you look into the picture, the object gets smaller and smaller. And then artists uh, basically, basically uh, uh, stimulated by architects who were interested in the, into the geometry and the, uh, the mathematics of the situation. Uh, uh, most of the, many of some of them became, uh, you know, uh, bronze workers like Donatello who had probably, on, on on the rest of uh, Renaissance art, probably the most influential uh, 
more influence than anybody else because of his 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 uh, displays of uh, of linear perspective. The first one you see is in, on the left way, the Feast of Herod. Actually, you know the uh, the orthogonals of the railroad tracks bring you into the center of the thing, and, and you, you're compelled to look to the left and to the right to see what's going on. I mean, it's a, it draws you into the picture, and you're looking in. You're, you're looking outside of the plane of the picture to looking into a three-dimensional space. And that was the amazing thing about it. Donatello is basically a, um, a, a sculptor. He did, the, uh, the, did the, the main altar in the cathedral in Padua. And if you go there, you will be amazed. I mean, his crucifix, the central, the central piece of the, uh, again, of the enthroned Madonna and the surrounding saints, are absolutely spectacular. It is, a, it, is the, it is always an operating church, although it is a tremendously, tremendously um, attended uh, tourist site. And many and all the tourists bow their heads. And I've seen a few of them drop to their knees. It's the most spectacular place you'll ever want to go. I, I recommend you, if you're ever in Padua, we'll go to there. And um, he has a, a number of these uh, th three-dimensional, what we call them, predellas around. This one is called a praying donkey. You probably can't see it very well, but I put it in because I think it's it's apropos of today. Uh, this is St. Anthony walking down the street with carrying the, uh, the Blessed Sacrament. And he's walking past a fellow who didn't believe, who denied the, 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 uh, denied the, pre the presence of Christ within, within, the, sac uh, within the sacrament. And uh, as uh, St. Anthony is passing by, the donkey falls on his knees. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't know if this story is true, but it's a great story. It makes a great, great uh, subject in, in, in art. Well, next slide, please. Well, Masaccio only lived, Masaccio only lived uh, like 27 years. It's an amazing thing about him. But then began, you know, one of the, one of the greatest eras in the history of art, you know, the 15th century. And it went on for another, another maybe 30 or 40 years in the beginning of the 16th century. And we call it the, the, what's called the grand maybe Renaissance. But anyway, in the front, let me just depict what happened in, in that century by com contrasting two artists that came after Masaccio, Fra Filippo Lippi and uh, Sandro Botticelli. Uh, the first one representing the first half of the, of the, fifth, of the 15th century and the second one, the second half. They were both both fantastic uh, painters, uh, both tremendously successful in their time, um, and and throughout history. I mean, they have always been venerated uh, by by uh, artists. Uh, I think they both had a deep faith, <laughs> but interestingly enough, they they were really uh, they had a, a a sensual nature that I don't think was always uh, in control. Obviously, it wasn't. Um, but they were living at the time that, you know, you would say that in a period like that, that produced such fantastic, it would be a very reverent, holy period. It was just the opposite. The 15th century was a period of terrible promiscuity uh, in all, of all kinds. Um, and... Um, uh, it didn't show up in the art because, except in, in private, uh, private pieces, they never displayed that kind of art publicly. Uh, if you look at Messiah, if you look at these two guys and their angels, you would think they were saints. Uh, Lippi, Lippi, uh, he he had a he had a problem. He had an addiction. His addiction was lust. I mean. I mean and I don't know about Botticelli. He burnt most of his uh, non-religious paintings in the bonfire of vanities at the end of the century. But the, the Madonna with two angels on the left is exquisite. It may, it's probably and the the, the, the uh, Madonna was probably uh, a girl that he got pregnant and became his wife, of course. But you know that's that's I'm just um, people. Men are men. You have to tell art tells you the truth. You have to accept the truth. As I'm not saying, I think that they were, they had, they did have a deep faith. Botticelli, especially, his Madonnas are much more reflective and thoughtful. This is the Madonna of the Eucharist. You see uh, the grapes and the stalks of, 
of weed coming out of the out of it. I'm spending too much time on this. I have to, so I have to go on, but I mean, you get the idea. By the way, this this uh, this Madonna of the Eucharist is in Boston. Somebody was just telling me about being in Boston. It's in the Garden Museum. Every time I've been in Boston, I've go I've gone to see it. I wouldn't go to Boston without getting a chance to see it. Next slide. Well, what well, the same thing was kind of happening in music. Uh, and, it, it was starting to become solipsistic in around the 1200. And the first guy that ever uh, uh, attached his name to a piece of music was a guy named Leonin, who was the, the concertmeister, uh, the chief musical guy in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And um, of course, at that time, chant was, was a predominant form of music. And when he started introducing into chant other voices and so forth, and he started started to what would instead of being monophonic one voice started to become multiple voices uh, and this uh, this uh, of course trend expanded and the next 200 years I could name a, a dozen or more people who, who well known in the history of music who carry this tradition on in Italy the probably the, the guy who had the most influence was a guy called Landino uh, who, who invented the lead of the Ladino uh, cadence, which was very important in the development of the madrigal. Madrigal is a kind of uh, of um, of choir chamber music. You know, they have all different instruments playing their own kind of thing, and yet making a kind of a harmonious whole. Uh, and the madrigal became the primary expression of secular music in the period from 12 to 1400. By the 1400, it was everywhere in Europe, everywhere in Europe. Next slide. Uh, the Council of Trent did not look kindly on, on the polyphonic music. They actually condemned it. They thought it, take, it took the worshiper away, that the technique and the, the intricacies of the music took the uh, worshiper away from the main idea, which is center your thoughts on God. And, uh, uh, but, uh, and they actually condemned it in a way, no, not condemned it, but said that we should, it shouldn't be allowed. But that was totally negated by basically by one guy, a guy named the Palestrina, who was the chief musician at the Vatican, who uh, just showed that um, that even though uh, in polyphonic movement uh, the, you have a group of uh, voices that are moving or tend to move independently, he showed that the total quality of the music, the total center, tonal center of the music and the clarity of its message could be maintained and beautifully maintained with polyphony. And so polyphony gradually became accepted and became part of, um, of, of, of sacred music. He wrote a mass called the Mass of uh, Pope Marcellus, which is uh, still played today. And ever, as I said, musicians like of every kind uh, uh, admire admire it, and and, uh, and and I recommend you. You have to listen to it to appreciate it. Next slide. Well, you know, at the at the end, of the, even though the first. The first 30 years of the 16th century, say from 1500 to 15, maybe 50, it's called the, the great period of the Renaissance, the magnificent period. You had some of the greatest people working at that time. It was a period of total disruption and impending, impending uh, disrepair in, 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 uh, in, in European affairs. <laughs> Um, as you know, um, uh, there was economic uh, distress and uh, invasions at the beginning of the 15th century. It was the beginning of the um, Reformation in 1517. And in 1527, the um, Rome was sacked, not by Huns, not by anybody else, but by, by uh, hungry, unpaid soldiers of the uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, which, which was obviously not holy or Roman. Um, but but thought in music at that time was very, very, very deep um, in the 15th century. 
the, a number of uh, groups, they, they had in, in that time a number of groups called Camerata, which were like think tanks. And one of them was formed by a, a banker named Bardi, the Camerata de Bardi. You can still see the place in Florence where these guys met if you go there. And there was a guy named uh, Girolamo May, who was one of the foremost um, uh, Greek scholar in the world, probably at the time. He had read everything, every Greek work to be read and, could, and was a, a man recognized as the master for that. And in his, in his think tank, he inspired a guy named Vincenzo Galilei, who happened to have a son named Galileo, who became a, probably one of the most famous scientists in the world. But uh, Vincenzo was a, uh, was a mathematician. He followed Pythagoras. He thought that there was a connection between music and, uh, and uh, math. And he worked on this thing and he developed, and um, uh, he was inspired by May who said, that the reason why music was almost as important to the, as more, just as important to the Greeks as religion was that it touched the soul, their soul. And why did it do that? And May said it's because they had, when somebody expressed his thoughts, it was one voice, one melody. And he said, that's, you know, if we want, if we want to, want music to mean we have to we have to do that well in a way that's like quintessential solipsism you know what i mean it's that again man is the measure of all things but it is you get the truest expression you know of, of human feelings by one person telling his feelings and what is happening to him not by a group of people all all singing different different tunes you know, in a way even though no matter how 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 beautifully they were put together and uh, that idea took, and by the end of the century, and a matter of fact, in, in 1600, the first so-called opera was written. This is a musical drama in which you had, instead of choruses and madrigal singings, and th you had one person at, at, at one particular point singing to his particular problem. And that was really the beginning of the aria, although it wasn't really an aria, it was, it was talk, set the music. It's kind of like sing song talk. Well, within a few years of that, a, a universal genius named Claudio Monteverdi uh, wrote an opera called Orfeo, which was, this guy was a, this guy was a genius. You can take my word for it. Um, and he was recognized as such in his lifetime. But then he, he wrote uh, the first, uh, I think, really great tr grand opera. He incorporated all the elements of, uh, of opera, you know, um, a, uh, an, an overture and every and, and, and the dramatic development and and the so-called the so-called uh, opera which at that time was called the stile representivo but uh, his his stile representivo was very arioso very melodic it wasn't wasn't like sing song it was almost it was almost a, almost an aria but we could call it probably the, the first aria that um, that existed. Next slide. Well, I mean, uh, after, after the 1500 came, uh, uh, art, took, art, art, art got involved with the, uh, with the Counter-Reformation starting in 1600. And then music just uh, in the form of opera just took off on its own, its own direction, as if the Counter-Reformation wasn't happening. And um, it, uh, it became intensely popular. By the end of the, the 1600s, there were opera houses all over, all over the place. Well, I wanted to get too much into the Counter-Reformation, and it's uh, but you can, you can learn as much about that time through art as, as, through, as, as through reading about it. Next slide. Um, uh, as the Reformation uh, went on, you were bound to be represented in art, and. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, uh, here's 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 two sides of that. Franz uh, Hals Laughing Cavalier uh, expresses the kind of the um, the, the uh, simplistic re rejoicing in the simplicity of the uh, uh, of the whole thing. You know, you don't have to you don't have to go through hours of repentance and 
praying on your knees, you're saved. All you have to do is say you're saved. You know, you've heard that before. And um, that's it. And uh, we're, we're, um, we're a mound of dung covered with snow, right? But uh, he's got nice clothes on. He looks really, you know, he's smiling. He looks a little cocky with his upturned mustache. Uh, that's, that, that's how, that's how on a lot of uh, Protestant reform, I get people I like this, this picture. Of course, Rembrandt, you know, one of the greatest guys, most versatile painters of all time, could paint any, any, any form of, of, uh, of uh, genre. Uh, he had, he was interesting because he, all his life, he painted self-portraits. I don't know how many he painted, a couple dozen or more. This one is at the end of his life. You see the circle there. Circle is a representation of perfection. And I don't know what he's thinking of, but you know, I think his thoughts were completely different from the Laughing Cavalier. Uh, Rembrandt's mother and father were both baptized Catholic. He was, he knew Catholic, uh, he never joined a church, didn't, uh, when, when I, I was way not to, <laughs> not to be affiliated with any church, but I think he's worrying about this problem of redemption, you know, maybe he's saying to himself, yeah, you know, maybe there's more to it than just, I'm saved. Anyway, that's just my interpretation. That's what art does and does to you. It gets you thinking about things and puts puts uh, things into perspective. Art and historical things into a perspective that you know that you would like like to consider. Next slide. Well, uh, I like to give you a lot of examples of, uh, of the aria, which is uh, the quintessential sol solipsism in music, but uh, it, it takes too long. Every, 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 uh, every uh, aria that I would take at least five or seven minutes, we wouldn't have time to do it. But we can go through a bunch of uh, profiles, which is the, which is the uh, solips basic solipsism in, in art. And we all love portraits, right? We all love, we all love as I said, well, self-centeredness is not bad. It's not a bad thing necessarily, but I mean, it's, it's, it, it is what it is. Uh, most, most portraits at that time were profile, in profile. And that's because through, through all the centuries, most, most, uh, most depictions of people were, uh, were only rulers on coins or rich people on coins who had who had their image put on a coin? That was not. That was a an, another form of art which we are totally neglecting today. But the profile was the was the way. Next slide. We're almost done. Uh, this this is probably one of the most famous profiles in all of uh, of history. Of these people say it, and I want to believe it. This is a beautiful young lady. I don't know who she is. It doesn't matter who she is. It was painted by a guy named Polaiuolo. He, he was a fantastic sculptor, uh, not basically a painter. I don't know why he painted this. Probably he was getting paid. He needed the money, I guess. Uh, uh, that time, you know, was really a meritocracy. If you had talent, it didn't matter whether you, were, you came from a rich or poor family, you were recognized for having it. And so, so he, Palaiuolo means uh, son of a chicken guy. His father was a chicken, you know, raised chickens, you know, so what? You know, he could, he was a great artist. But this lady, this, this, this portrait is fantastic. People admire it. And I think people at the time admired it. And father said, hey, you know, this is a good way to advertise. I got a good looking daughter. Yeah, I, I have her portrait, maybe the dowry, dowry will go down, I won't have to, I won't have to put up too much of a dowry to, to, to get her married, you know, probably right. But anyway, this is a magnificent piece. Just, just look at it, just look at the detail of her hair, of her ear, of her, the gracefulness of her neck and the design and the, I don't know, go on forever about this one. Go ahead, next slide. Well, it wasn't very long after that, we, you know, we, we didn't get profiles. We started, the first, first three quarter portrait was done by Leonardo. By the way, I ain't gonna take the time, but I made a terrible boo-boo in this slide, a terrible boo-boo. I called the artist Da Vinci. You never do that, never, never. You, it's either Leonardo Da Vinci or Leonardo. 
Never Da Vinci, never Da Vinci. I made a mistake, so I apologize to anybody who's listening, okay? Anyway, this is the first, uh, this is Ginevra Da Vinci. He, Leonardo only did four four female portraits, and this is one of them. You know the Mona Lisa, this is, is the other one. Next slide. Well, uh, women, uh, women, I uh, said, uh, then started to, uh, like, like, like their portraits taken, and they take a predominant part in, in art. In, in, in busts and in sculpture, not so much, but they they could at times. Uh, the one on the left here, I, I just had to show this because I love it. I, I could have skipped this slide. Um, Andrea Verrocchio did this bust of a woman. She's elegant, she's refined, she's cultured, she's thoughtful, she's a real person, you know? I like her hairdo, I like it better than the Roman lady's hairdo. Um, uh, you know, I, it's a nice lady. I like the. You know, I wouldn't mind me saying meet that. And the interesting thing to me also is that her her composure, the her her shoulders and the way she holds her arms are similar similar. I, I think to to the Bruges Madonna. Do you agree with me? Anyway, that's just 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 a little personal thing. The Bruges Madonna has a fantastic story on its own, which is, uh, I love. It's the one. It's fantastic. Believe me, but I'm not going to tell it now. Next slide. And so, you know, uh, art became, you know, uh, the powerful, powerful, whatever we represented in art. And it tell, gives it, and that tells you a lot about the times in which they live. The Doge Loredan lived at a time, he was a Doge in, in Venice. Venice was rich and powerful and uh, yeah, rich and powerful. And then he shows it, everything in this play, this is, it is it's a, everybody considers this a, one of the greatest portraits ever painted is done by a guy named Giovanni Bellini. He was a Venetian painter. And the one on the left is a Raphael of uh, Pope Julius uh, the second. Uh, of course, this is obviously, he's not very happy. And it was not a very happy time. I mean, bad times were there and the worst was about to happen. Next slide. Well, I, I think you find portraits interesting, so, but we'll just run through, just run through a couple more. The, um, the, 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 the guy on the left wrote one of the most famous books of the time called uh, the, Cour the Courtesan, the, uh, the Courtier. Uh, it's a book on, you know, uh, how, how, to, how to be most popular party, how to have the best stories. You have to, of course, you had to know the, a lot about art and music and science and politics and all that stuff. And you had to be a wonderful raconteur. He is very, very confident, very positive, very elegant, don't you think? And about the same time, you know, on the left is a young banker uh, in Florence. Uh, his, his future was very uncertain. And I think you can see that in this portrait. I don't want to go into it. By the way, he, he, he became one of the bankers to the Medicis after the, after the sack of Rome. And uh, the, the, those Medicis were totally different from the Medicis in the previous century. They were all tyrants. And of course, tyrants love bankers. And so his, you should see his future portraits. They completely different. They, next slide. And Dr. Rossi, we're about three minutes um, from yeah, okay. questions, right. if you want to do that. Yeah, OK. All right. Well, I mean, I could show that this is what this is. Lady on the left here is Da Vinci's um, uh, lady with an ermine. She's a 17 year old mistress. You can see the, the woman on the right is Isabella Desi, one of the most famous um, women of the time. She was a fantastic uh, uh, ruler in, in Mantua. So just, just run through the next slide till we get down to the end here. Okay, well, we'll skip that one. I mean, that, that would take a little while, but the, this is a portrait of a modern woman. And I don't want to say art reflects the times, you know? I think this, and just stop and think that, you know, 500 uh, years, 200 years from now, people are going to look at the music and the art of, of this time and, and, and judge our, our civilization. Next slide. I'll just end with this. Portraiture now, of course, is not painting anymore. It's photography. And these are the two of the greatest portraits of my time, I think. And they, they depict what is going on in our time. The one on the left is the, the uh, portrait of the Afghan, which was on the, uh, on the uh, what do you call it, the, the travel, famous travel magazine, National Geographic. 
uh, before the Afghan war, which is still going on. I mean, you, you, everything that's happened since, I think is, is in her face. And the, uh, the one on the uh, right is the Dust Bowl mother, probably somewhere in Kansas or, or Oklahoma during the depression, terrible drought, everybody's starving. She's got two hungry, sick children on her shoulder. And she has to leave her home with nothing but the clothes on her back. I say, yeah, you know, art can tell you a lot about the time in which we live. All right, I hope I hope you all got. To, I don't want to, I don't want to go on any further. That's it. Okay, are we on time?